Hi, everybody. This is Douglas Reeves from Creative Leadership Solutions. Thanks so much for joining our webinar today, Critical Thinking from the Classroom to the Boardroom. You know, you can't find a mission statement or a vision statement that doesn't talk about 21st century skills, prominently including critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, and so on. But one of the things that I've noticed in my work with schools in all 50 states and 25 countries is that we honor critical thinking more in the label than we do actually in the classroom. And the bottom line of today's seminar is that we can in incorporate this in every classroom, but it's only going to happen if we model it as adults. And I'm going to suggest that, that is everything from people who teach our youngest students all the way to people who are making policy, policy decisions in the boardroom. As always, this webinar will be recorded and the video and audio access is available for free. It'll be available at creativeleadership.net. Same goes for the slides. I'm happy to share those with anybody who's interested. Uh, a few notes about format. Throughout this discussion, uh, I encourage you to uh, be continuously interactive. You can use the chat function or the question function on GoToWebinar. I also understand some of you are just listening by phone and not on a computer. So you can text me from anywhere in the world, country code 1-781-710-9633. If you're not in front of a screen, I'll say it again. Country code 1-781-710-9633. And I hope that you find these discussions, even those that you find provocative, a way to bring together teachers, students, and parents. And finally, this is a very safe place for challenges. Some of the things I'll say are maybe things that you disagree with. And I just need you to know that I welcome that and I learn from that. After all, critical thinking is about comparing the statements people make with the evidence available. And I welcome those challenges because I think that's how both of us will learn more. So I'll say a few words about critical thinking, both for children and for adults challenge some of the prevailing assumptions that are out there, uh, talk about at the leadership level, including at the board level, how we can improve critical thinking by having mutually exclusive decision alternatives, and then suggest a better model of change. How do we take what we've learned today and then apply it in changes from classroom level to policy level? So let's first of all talk about the primary importance of critical thinking. The essence is this. Can you compare a claim to the evidence? You know, kindergartners and first graders can do this. They can look at a headline and then listen to, or perhaps a few of them read, what is be below in the story and say, does that story really support that headline? They can do the same thing in a work of fiction. Is the chapter title supported by what they read in the book? The essence of critical thinking is always saying, what's the claim, what's the evidence? And that is as true in a kindergarten room as it is in a high school calculus and chemistry class. Every academic skill, I would argue, requires critical thinking. In fact, this may be contrary to what a lot of us think, but I've written a lot about creativity and done a lot of re research on creativity, and I would argue you can't get to creativity if you're not first willing to engage in critical thinking. Because, because creativity requires us to say, well, what's the prevailing ethic here? You know, the use of 36 colors in the palette, the use of 12 tones in the scale, and then say, I wonder what would happen if I challenged that. That's how some of the most amazing developments in art, in music, in literature take place, because we've, we've turned the model on its head. Think of the way that we have interactive fiction now. That challenged the turn the page from one to two to three, to interactive fiction that involves the reader as a co-author. And it's also the foundation of effective communication and collaboration. I fear very much that when we talk about communication and collaboration, too often it's what the late Rick before called collaboration. Uh, people will talk past one another or they'll kind of superficially reinforce one another when far more effective is to say, let me try to understand this. Here's what you say the claim is. Please help me understand what the evidence is behind it. To be clear, critical thinking does not need to be adversarial. It does not need to be competitive. It does certainly not need to be demeaning. But it does need to always be asking questions, comparing the claim to the evidence. So what are some uh, research that we can look to 
to support the idea that children of every age can do this, especially if you're a young parent or maybe a young grandparent. I want to recommend to you Alison Gopnik's amazing book, The Scientist in the Crib. What she says is that children, including babies, are natural born hypothesis testers. And they will try things, and when they work, they do more of it. When they don't, they do less of it. And we way underestimate the ability of babies and toddlers and kindergartners to engage in critical thinking, most particularly by asking, did this strategy work? It's also part of making great social connections. Uh, some kids try some pretty antisocial behaviors when they're toddlers and even into the later years. And one of the most powerful conversations that we can have is not, don't do that, do this, but rather, did that work? And it's a very powerful question for little kids, and I would argue for adults as well, when we challenge ourselves to say, did it work? Uh, Norman Webb, who has made such a contribution uh, from the University of Wisconsin in his depth of knowledge research, talks about four different levels. And when, he, when we get to the top level, students can design, they can take risks, they can modify, they can create. Well, that's only true if we have an environment where it's safe to design, take risks, modify, and, and create. Um, at, at a very technical level, that means, for example, now that first trimester progress reports are coming out around the world, that means that we say, wait a minute, we're not gonna punish kids today for the mistakes they made nine weeks ago. It means that the uh, penalty for taking a risk and failing is not a low mark on the electronic grade book, but rather feedback that leads to better communication and better uh, student achievement. Too often, we talk a good game about taking risks, but we punish taking risks at every level. So, uh, and by the way, I should have mentioned that Alison Gopnik is a neuroscientist at, at Stanford. Um, these are a couple of resources that I really recommend to you, and uh, Professor Webb has got some great resources available for free on the web. So, let's move from talking about babies and toddlers to talking about us. Uh, here are four case studies that I'm gonna ask you to consider in just a minute. And I'll ask you to just choose one, because these are things on which people have very strong feelings. A learning styles theory, certainly what I was raised on, and, and professors who I greatly revere believe that. A multiple intelligences, I've had the good fortune to co-present with Howard Gardner at, at local Boston library events. Uh, what an amazing and thoughtful person. Personalized learning is the rage right now. Change leadership is something that we've been talking about for decades, and there is, I think, emerging research on that, part of which I'll share with you in a moment. So choose one of these things that you feel very strongly about. Learning styles theory, multiple intelligences, personalized learning, and change leadership. And then I'm gonna give you a minute to say, what do you know and what don't you know about those? And if you'd be kind enough, use the question function or the chat function to respond to what do you already know and what don't you know. See you back here in a minute. About 30 more seconds, please. And let's come back to the seminar. So I asked you to think about what you already know and what you don't know. And I would just offer uh, my own insights on this and how I've had to learn uh, some things that I used to think were true and now I know are not true. 
Um, and by the way, as a prelude to this discussion, another great book recommendation I would offer to you is by uh, Professor Richard Elmore at Harvard. That's E-L-M-O-R-E -E, uh, in the book, I Used to Think and Now I Think. Howard Gardner's got a chapter in there, as does Dick. And I would just have to tell you, if you've got Dick Elmore and Howard Gardner be willing to change their ideas, saying, I used to think this, but now I think that, then for goodness sake, the rest of us ought to be able to do that as well. So uh, I was taught that learning styles theory, that is every student is visual, um, kinesthetic or auditory, explained how they learned. And moreover, you could diagnose that accurately and you'd be able to teach to a particular style to match what the student's learning style is and result in better achievement. But there are two problems that have emerged over the course of a lot of research on this subject. Number one, the learning styles assessments themselves are not consistent. That is, today's visual kid could be tomorrow's auditory kid and the next day's kinesthetic kid. And if you don't have a consistent measurement, you can't possibly use it. It would be as if you went to the grocery store and there was a scale on there and you put a pound of bananas on there and it says 16 ounces. Great, that's a pound. You do it again, it says eight ounces. You do it again, it says 32 ounces. You wouldn't trust that scale because it's inconsistent. The same is true with respect to learning styles theory assessments. And the second, even deeper flaw is that, assume for the sake of argument, you think you've really got the right assessment. Even if you use that style to teach in that way, then theoretically that ought to result in better achievement. Study after study after study, most recently shared by John Hattie, by Robert Marzano, and many others who have looked at multiple studies here, conclude it's just not true. And it breaks my heart uh, to admit that I'm wrong about this, but I'd have to tell you, I'd rather admit that I'm wrong than have a bad theory continue to be perpetuated. And by the way, I'll just add as a footnote, a real acid test for researchers and for professional developers is ask them when the last time was that they made a real dumb mistake in research. And if we can't raise our hand and say, that's me, I made some, then it's not very credible. It's not very credible if every time they do a study, it always conveniently, uh, uh, conveniently supports their hypothesis. We've got to be willing to admit we were wrong. Let's go to the next one, multiple intelligences theory. So I was asked a few weeks ago by a, a professor in Canada if I could recommend someone who would be a critic of multiple intelligence theory because it was so pervasive and so widespread, he was trying to uh, offer two sides of the coin. And they said, you want to know who the most thoughtful and articulate critic of multiple intelligences theory is? It's Howard Gardner, who is this incredibly brilliant, self-effacing, genius scholar, and yet has said in writing and in person many times that articulating a theory is not the same thing as testing it, and that much more research is necessary in order to, uh, to make this work. So it in no way invalidates the idea that we ought to posit theories for further consideration. But it absolutely contradicts the idea that people can say with certainty, these are the intelligences, it's proven, and therefore we can have, for example, a multiple intelligences school. Uh, that is uh, getting the cart way before the horse and trying to implement something that still needs an evidentiary foundation. Personalized learning is the key to preparing students for the 21st century. I must say that just yesterday I read this great article in the Chronicle of Higher Education trying to track down what the origin of this was. Because when I hear people say things like project-based learning is 21st century, and then I say, wait a minute, didn't, didn't John Dewey say that in about 1928? Or uh, personalized learning, wait a minute, didn't, didn't Ben Bloom talk about that in the 1960s? And in yesterday's Chronicle, they identified personalized learning in mathematics in particular as originating in 1920. So I'm not knocking personalized learning. I am absolutely knocking the idea that it's a brand new 21st century idea. It's always been necessary to identify what student learning is and to meet the needs of different students. Change leadership requires buy-in through a broadly in inclusive guiding coalition. You know, John Cotter's a brilliant guy who has written thoughtfully on change leadership, as is Michael Fullen. And I had dinner with Michael and I said, you know, uh, anytime people don't want to change, they quote you to say, don't you know change requires five to seven years? And Michael said, yes, that's exactly what I said in 1991. But I've learned a few things in over 25 years of studying this. And one of them 
is the need to accelerate the pace of change. And a broadly applied psychological principle is that it's not change the attitude and the behavior by first of all getting buy-in through some uh, very persuasive oratory. It's rather that, pers that behavior precedes belief, even before people buy into it. They change their behavior, then they see the results, and then they buy in. And that is true on all manner of things from changing health habits to changing educational policies. So I want you to stop again for 60 seconds and identify at least one surprising thing that you learned about one of these four things. I'll reconvene us in 60 seconds. About 30 more seconds, please. And back to large group, please. Um, Thanks to several of you who uh, noted that personalized learning is all the rage now, but it lacks what uh, Dr. James Popham of UCLA used to say was descriptive rigor. That is, I hear a lot of people talking about it, and then when I say, so what does personalized learning really mean, it's very hard to get a clear definition. I will tell you that one place that I think is doing this right is Singapore American School, and Jennifer Sparrow, who's the deputy superintendent, is leading that effort, but they spent a day trying to nail down what, um, what personalized learning really means. Um, others of you asked, uh, what was it that made learning styles theory so attractive? And I would tell you that, uh, if, I, if I'm not being too bold here, what makes any myth attractive is that like the myth of why does the sun rise and set with the chariot across the sky, because it helps to explain things that are mysterious. And so anybody who's taught young kids know that, my goodness, there's so many different things going on, and how can they be the same age from the same you know, background and have wildly different learning um, styles, so it appears. And so this theory helped us to explain things that were unexplainable. But just as with multiple intelligences, it was just a theory. And the vendors got way out in front on this and started selling learning styles inventories, just like you can find people selling things about multiple intelligences that Howard Gardner would not endorse. So I, I think by and large, we have to ask whenever we hear belief systems, we have to appreciate that those belief systems may make people comfortable, may help explain things that are not explainable, but they're not evidence-based. And our job is to be critical consumers of research not just passive receptors of research. Before I go on, I might, might just say, if we have some university faculty uh, listening in, uh, here is my plea to you. When we're teaching research and statistics classes at the graduate level, um, and even undergraduate level, but to students who are going to be teachers and education leaders, let's dispense with a 600 page research and stat textbook. And instead, as I'm working with one university to do right now, replace that with a series of articles and advertisements. And the advertisements say, buy our program because, and the whole semester is, compare the claim to the evidence. And we can learn some research techniques and statistics along the way. But what you really want to be able to do is to be a critical consumer before somebody tries to sell you something. So let's think about change in particular. This is one of the big ones right now. And I think that one of the reasons that change efforts are failing around the world is that we are still relying on models from the 80s, 70s, 60s that might have been appropriate then, but they're the wrong assumptions and the wrong tools. For example, in order for people to change, 
They change their knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. And that has been the model for a long time. But it's not, it does not comport with the evidence of the last uh, 10 years. Uh, it's not just that training will, will change them and then right actions follow. It's, it's in fact that uh, people have to behave their way into belief. Anybody in the therapeutic community will tell you about the as if evidence that says you behave as if you don't want a cigarette, even when you crave one, as if you don't want to drink, even when you want one, as if you wanted to exercise, even when you don't feel like. That as if has the premise that behavior comes before belief, not that belief comes before behavior. And yet there are elements of school culture that support these wrong and ancient assumptions because after all, all of us, everybody on this webinar, went to school, was successful in school, went to college. So it worked well for us, but I don't think that's the same as extrapolating to say it works well for all of our students. And they're the wrong tools. You can see these in front of you, the rallies, the committees and coalitions, the structure and hierarchy, the rewards and punishments, let's face it, get on board or get out, got to have the right people in the bus we've been told for 25 years. And perhaps least helpful change training and attitude surveys. And I want to deconstruct each one of these briefly. You and I have all been to these rallies where with enough zeal, somebody will say, you know, now we've got buy-in. It's an illusion. A great book I want to recommend to you is The Knowledge Illusion by Sloman and Fernbach of MIT, who will talk about the inappropriate confidence we place in things when other people around us appear to believe it. It is an illusion and it's short-lived. There's also, <coughs> excuse me, a suppression of skeptics. And I would argue skeptics are really valuable. Skeptics are people, not who are bad folks, but they just want to say, I've seen 20 hot deals come and go in my career. I want to see the beef. I want to see the evidence. And when we avoid those people, we avoid the important deliberations and sharing of evidence that would really help long-term success. And every time we hold these rallies, you can see, if you're paying attention, the cynics rolling their eyes and saying, here we go again. Uh, as the coffee mug goes, one more meeting that could have been an email, one more rally that you could have just phoned it in. And it is not helping the cause of change. So let's, uh, let's talk about coalitions. John Cotter, what a thoughtful, brilliant guy at the Harvard Business School is well known for guiding coalitions. And here's the problem. When we bring together particularly large ones, sometimes in school systems, they'll see 25, 30, 35 people on the guiding coalition. What they tend to do is act like a mini Congress. I'm not really here to represent the interests of the nation. I'm here to represent the interests of my district. And so everybody supposedly has a voice and I'm representing the parents, I'm representing the teachers, I'm representing the administrators, which quickly becomes adversarial rather than a search for what's best for the entire system. And they don't have to identify the essential stakeholders. Uh, one of the most thoughtful board members I ever met, um, I asked, so who do you represent? And she said, I'm not here to represent the people who were already at the table. I'm here to represent those who are not here. And she specifically mentioned people who would not even be in their school system for five or six years. That's the kind of thoughtful, engaging, broad view that we need uh, for coalition members. And, and just so you don't think that I'm dissing Professor Cotter, um, he wrote two amazing articles. And, and here's another good example of somebody who's just dead honest. So in the 90s, he wrote the, you know, how to do transformational change. And here's what he said just 10 years later in an article that began with, 90% of change efforts are failing. He said a successful guiding team might only have three to five people during the first year. Organizations that fail expect the team to be led by a strategic planning unit rather than the line manager. Now, I just wanna to suggest to you that if John Cotter is willing to say transformation efforts are failing, then we need to take him seriously. And one reason that they fail is that we delegate these to strategic planners. I, I wrote a chapter actually one time in a book called Saving Strategic Planning from Strategic Planners. 
So to be clear, many of you do strategic plans. I'm not objecting to that. It's the strategic planners that I'm objecting to because they get in the way of the relationship between the line managers, that is the superintendents, the principals, the teachers who actually have got to make this work. Um, and so let's skip to structure and hierarchy. When we try to implement top-down change, the focus winds up being on boss-pleasing rather than accomplishment. Um, and the problem is, is that everybody likes to have these broad visions. You, you, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we had uh, leadership 2020 visions in a lot of school systems until I heard a superintendent say, uh, wait a minute, uh, 2020, uh, when you take away summer vacations is uh, only a very few months from now. So the answer to that is not a sense of urgency, but let's have 2025 or 2030. Uh, we really have to focus away from these gauzy visions of the future to getting real work done that provides short-term reinforcement so that we can achieve long-term goals. And formal organization structure and systems don't lead renewal. Uh, renewal happens from the inside out. And the best example I can give you in schools is that I've seen the identical uh, practice uh, attempted by different schools, one, by a revolving door of consultants and speakers to, for example, improve grading practices, and the other that says, wait a minute, let's do inside out change. And after hearing the revolving door of everybody, a single teacher was willing to display, here's how I changed my practice, here's how I reduced student failure, here's how that bought us as a group more electives. It was a fabulous way for people to be able to see inside out change, not structure and hierarchy. And what about rewards and punishments? Um, rewards and punishments we've known since the day of B.F. Skinner were work really well with rats, uh, but not so much with people. Uh, the culture of fear and intimidation, kind of like the culture of a school bully on the playground, will work in the short term, but it displaces intrinsic motivation. And if you really want long-term engagement, we have to have people doing this, not because of a policy or command, but because it's the right thing to do. Moreover, be careful about these rewards, because today's reward becomes tomorrow's entitlement. And we say we like teamwork, that's another big 21st century skill, and yet we persist in individual evaluation that pits one teacher against another, one student against another, one leader against another, it is toxic. And finally, change training. We really have to be um, introspective about this. A four-year study of organizational change suggested that the great obstacle to revitalization is the idea that it comes about through change programs, particularly when a staff sponsors them. Very reminiscent of what John Cotter said. It's the fallacy of programmatic change. You want to make it work, we've got to have clarity linking senior leaders to people on the front line. And surveys. I know many of you do these climate surveys and attitudinal surveys. They're all the rage. You spend a lot of money on them, except for one small problem with two, new 2017 research. Everybody lies. Uh, this is by a author named Steph Stevens Davidovitz, and he is he used to be a, a data scientist for Google. He's now the uh, data analysis writer for the New York Times. In this book, you will find deeply disturbing because he'll take demonstrable differences between how people fill out surveys and what the truth is. For example, you survey people and 60% will say that we've got library cards. You can look at the public records and find out that 20% of people do. 80% will say we're registered to vote. You can look at the public rec records and say only 50% are. And he goes on and on with a wide variety of deeply disturbing responses. I'm not saying you shouldn't do surveys. Sometimes you have to do that. But you've got to compare it with the known data and not use it as an authoritative data set, particularly when um, so many school surveys that I see have a tiny, tiny response rate and oftentimes filled out by people with a crank against you. And so they get exaggerated compared to what the response of the total population would be. Therefore, if you've got to do a survey, please make sure you have as nearly universal response as possible. If you've got to do a pizza party for classrooms that get 100% of parents responding, whatever you need to do, do it and not let 
very tiny sample sizes distort important policy decisions. By the way, anonymity is of course important, but it's still not a guarantee of honesty. So I'm just suggesting you got to take these surveys with a grain of salt. There's better ways, objective observation of what people really do to determine what students want and what parents want rather than just attitudinal surveys. So how do we get it right? I'll close with this peak model, and that is passion, empiricism, action, and knowledge. Let's take these apart quickly. Um, if we've learned anything about the difference between passion and programs, it's that passions have a sense of urgency. Think of the lessons of Flint, Michigan. What a tragic story of water that was tainted and through the indolence of people at every level, children were allowed to consume water with toxins in them. Now, I just want to ask you, if you had that kind of problem in your school, would you say, well, I don't know, we ought to survey people first. I don't know, you know, the people who've, who've liked this water for a long time might not buy into our water purification program. You would not. You'd say, this is dangerous right now. We're going to deal with it. It would be the same thing if there was a problem with bus safety or crosswalk safety. It is a sense of urgency. And the argument I would make is that what you all do in terms of literacy and student support and behavior and engagement and opportunities post high school are all as important as any public safety issue. So you can't fight every battle based on that. But the evidence is overwhelming that when students don't complete high school, they have greater health risks, greater safety risks, greater criminal justice participation. Those are all things we can save when at the earliest possible age, we avoid student failure. So I want you to think about what the results would be if you improved literacy and math and, and failures in your own system. In the example I used a minute ago, just saving 30 failures means what? Not, not only fewer repeaters, reduced suspensions, better behavior, better faculty morale, more el electives. There's this entire virtuous cycle of things that happen when we have a sense of urgency right now. So please don't anybody say when you've got something that's important, we'll get to it next year or the year after that. Do it now. Empiricism. The best idea I can offer to you is to go beyond external studies. That's a place to start. I mean, I do some of them. John Hattie does them. That's a place to start but it's not the place to finish. What we need to do is to express hypotheses. Let, let me offer an example. Just earlier in the day, I was having a conversation about homework. And some people feel I was told that homework ought to count, and if students don't have it count, then their performance will decline. But I saw a very similar school that conducted this brilliant experiment. They all had the same final exam in this course, but three different teachers had three policies. One counted homework 50%, one 20%, one 0%. Now, the hypothesis in favor of homework would say that the one who counted at 50% should have the highest results, 20% lower, 0% way lower. It's not what happened. But nobody would believe that if I said it. It'll only be true if you find it with your students. You can design a simple experiment like that this semester and then compare the results to the hypothesis. So think about what our prevailing hypotheses are about homework. If you don't do it, you've got a character defect. About teacher evaluations. If we don't threaten and intimidate teachers, they won't get better. About test scores, that's the best way to evaluate students. About grading, um, if it doesn't count, they won't do it. I've heard all these hypotheses. I'd just like you to consider expressing them and then designing experiments to compare the results to the hypothesis. Next, we have action. Um, one of the things that I am very skeptical about is when people say we've got buy-in when they don't have action. Because when people claim to have buy-in, either they aren't asking for change or the opposition is simply underground. The arguments are in the parking lot, not in a deliberative setting where you can actually address them. And so my counsel to you is stop asking for buy-in. For example, there's a lot of evidence that says writing in different curriculum areas leads to better achievement in science and mathematics, social studies. But I don't have time for any of that. If, if I spent time on writing, then my scores would go down. Okay, so I'm not asking you to buy in. I'm asking you to engage in an experiment. Let's do the writing in science, social studies, 
mathematics, and let's see if the scores go down. And if that's true, you got a point. My research with more than a million kids says the op opposite is true. More writing yields higher results in all of those subjects. We conclude with knowledge. Knowledge that drives change happens from experience, not lectures. I, I wish I could tell you that watching me on the stage is what drives a change, but it doesn't. The best I can do is to prompt a series of inside out actions where people will say, I don't know if Doug's right or not, but I trust the person in room 102. I saw what she was able to accomplish with our kids. So what we need to create is internal to external knowledge, not external to internal. And as Bob Keegan has said at Harvard in the wonderful book, Immunity to Change, people aren't resisting it because they uh, are bad. They rather have competing commitments, not just to tradition and comfort zone, but because they genuinely believe that what they're doing is working. So I, I never challenge the motives of people who are reluctant to change. I, I believe that they're thoughtful people. And what we have to understand is here's one competing commitment. Let's consider an alternative and then empirically test it with evidence. So the peak model is pretty straightforward. Have a sense of urgency with deep passion. Experiment, including local experiments. Take action that precedes belief and then build knowledge from the inside out. Finally, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll take a couple of questions, is in the boardroom, we've got superintendents in the line, we've got board uh, members uh, on this webinar. The best advice I can offer you to have critical thinking in those forums is mutually exclusive decision alternatives. That is, before you just take a take it or leave it recommendation, this is what the staff says, recognize there was probably some disagreement before it came to you. And I think those disagreements ought to take place in front of the superintendent. And I realize that in a public setting, it's good to have a united front. In an executive session, let's hear some alternatives. I want to hear plan A, advantages and disadvantages. Plan B, advantages and disadvantages. And maybe you don't have time to do that on everything, but the three areas where every time I've coached superintendents, I hear that they wish they would have had more deliberation and debate is on people, finance, and technology, and curriculum. If, if we don't consider alternatives first, we can make some really expensive and time-consuming mistakes. In the famous phrase of Ron Brandt, we need to make sure that rather than congeniality, superficial getting along, we have collegiality. That is the trust and respect for one another that comes from thoughtful discussion and debate. So I want you to think of a need that you have for change and think of how this model might be helpful for you. Let's take a couple of questions before we adjourn and I'll go to the question function right now. Um, what's the um, website? It's creativeleadership.net. It'll probably be there in about an hour. It takes some time for the file to be consolidated and, and posted. But you'll also see lots of other free resources there, videos that I've done, uh, research, articles and so on. Just click on media and you'll see lots of things that are available at creativeleadership.net. Um, you said, what response rate do you recommend? Um, one source uh, you said suggests 26%. Um, you know, I, that's probably high compared to the three and 4% that I see, but I'm really concerned that I see a lot of culture and climate surveys that are, that are overrepresented by critics and underrepresented by those who are satisfied. The thinking goes, gee, if I'm satisfied, why do I need to fill out this form? So uh, when I said universal, I'm asking you to come to as close to 100% as you can. And if that requires some donuts uh, in the bus line, if that requires uh, some um, incentives at parent night, whatever you need, do that. Same for faculty. Um, you know, I, I understand you can't compel people to, uh, to participate, but the closer you get to 100%, the more reliable it's going to be. And I would deeply regret a bad curriculum, technology, or personnel decision to be made only on 26%. And by the way, uh, the source that I certainly acknowledge, 26% uh, is um, a little ambiguous because that is a function of sample size, not just percentage. So for example, when you'll hear in national political polls, well, gee, we didn't survey 200 million people, we just surveyed 300 people, and they said that was 
plus or minus 4%. Well, number one, <laughs> I think we all know that national polls are not exactly uh, done with scientific precision as we've seen in the last year. But number two, uh, the, the sample size representation uh, compared to the universal is based upon randomness. And you don't get randomness when you just have a voluntary sample. It is always distorted. So rather than a rule of thumb, um, I'm encouraging you to get as close to universal response as possible. And if you can't do that, at least make sure you have multiple data sources. You know, maybe both the survey and focus groups and personal interviews. Uh, don't settle for one thing. Uh, you said, how do you um, convince a superintendent to allow for executive session topics uh, such as curriculum or technology? Um, so I think it's really important, and, and I really respect the uh, perspective of superintendents who want to have a united front in public and don't want to have rancorous board me meetings. We've seen how, uh, how unhelpful those are. But I do believe in executive session. It's a very fair precedent for you to have um, ad advantages and disadvantages of alternatives so that it's in the best interest of the superintendent and the board when inevitably some decisions don't work out for them to be able to say, you know, we did consider other alternatives. We did consider both advantages and disadvantages. We didn't look at this with rose-colored glasses, and here's why we made the decision. I think that really protects the superintendent and board members rather than simply accepting a recommendation that nobody said had disadvantages to it. Well, we are at the 45 minute mark. You have been incredibly gracious um, in today's discussion. I always appreciate your, your deep interaction. Um, and uh, oh, and I see that there's a typo in creativeleadership.net. Uh, I'll depend upon you to uh, spell better than I did. Uh, that's how you can email me, and you're all welcome to uh, use my personal text and phone as well, or tweet me at Douglas Reeves. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend.